Okay, Job chapter 35. Elihu's still speaking, and he speaks the truth. Elihu spake moreover and said, Thinkest thou this to be right? What I've said in 34. That thou says, My righteousness is more than God's. And that's what he explained in chapter 34 is Job's self righteousness. And Elihu's like, Lord, uh, I mean, Job, do you see this true? Is what I told you the truth? Do you have a holier than thou conduct? And I assume that there's no answer. For thou sayest, What advantage will it be unto thee? And what profit shall I, Job, have if I be cleansed from my sin? And what is man? Is what he said. And Job is like, Well, what's it do to me if my sins are washed? And Job's attitude to sin is, well, it ain't going to do me no profit. Now, you remember, he spoke about the wicked man. Do what profit? And evidently, Elihu is caught onto the words of Job that they hit closer to the home than the wicked man. And today, we're in a, we're in a day and age to work profit, profit, profit. And I'm not talking about a man that tells the future. I'm talking about gaining more money. There are people out there who won't go to church because their their career, they won't give up their career because of the profit of a paycheck. There are businesses out there who won't shut down on Sundays because they'll make money. But what profit does it make if I'm cleansing my sin? A whole lot. You get a greater fellowship with God. And Job, if you were right and clean in the eyes of God, you may not have had your family gone. You may not have had all the distress and anguish but you're self-righteous you're better than god and god had to allow the devil to come in now remember the devil did it to destroy job now we're 35 chapters into the book of job we know that god allowed it for job's benefit now if god had told jo the devil do what you want to him touch his skin and he had not put the cause slay him not or kill him not what benefit would have been to Job if, if the devil would have killed him? The, jo uh, the, the devil would be pleased. Here comes a holy and righteous man. He's gone. He's out of the picture. I don't need to worry about him. And yet when we get to Job chapter 42, we're going to see that Job lived many, many years. and got to see his great and, and greater grandchildren. And with the aspect of Job chapter 42 is God has revealed to Job by his own mouth and by Elihu, you're a sinner. And Job will acknowledge his sin, and he will get right with his sin with God, and God will use him for greater. The devil wanted to kill Job, and I don't know how much the devil knows. I don't think he knows much. I don't know if the devil knew that Job would get right, it would be even greater. But at the moment of Job 1 and 2, Job was too right in his eyes with God. And there are Christians today that the devil, he may not know our future, but man, that guy keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. He's already on fire and he gets more on fire. I'm in trouble. Let me at him. And if we have sin in our life, God says, okay, go get him. But you don't kill him because I may have use of him. And we'll be if it's because, if it be, if it be because of sin. That we go sin too far and find God may say, okay, go ahead and take him. I can't use them. He says, I, Elihu, will answer thee, Job, and thy companions, the three guys. You know, I see no evil, I hear no evil, and I taste no evil with thee. So Elihu's going to address the company that he's with. And he's going to correct them all. And notice he says in verse 3, thou sayest. What advantage? It is believed, and I, I think a little bit later on, it's a belief that Elihu is the writer of Job. And it may be possible up to chapter 34 that Elihu is dictating everything that's said. It's a great possibility that Elihu is going through his papers, maybe. All right, this is what Job said over here, now I'm going to address it. Or maybe at this point he's making notes 
and having important details, and the Holy Spirit will allow him to fill in the blanks later. But he's quoting Job. Job is a Bible book. We quote from Job. That's what exactly what Elihu's doing. I will answer thee, thy companions with thee. Look unto the heavens. Now what he's going to do, he's going to look at God and Job. Job, you think you're so important? You think you're so wonderful? <coughs> Let's look at God's creation. Look to, the, look, look to the heavens, plural. There are three heavens, not seven. The heavens are from the earth to as far as the eagle can fly. From where the eagle can fly to God's throne, the universe, the, the sun, the moon, the stars, the comics, and all that. And then you got God's abode. Look to those three heavens, Joe. And one of those heavens he can't see. And see, you can't see the third heaven. Imagine if you could see heaven, heaven, capital H. And behold the clouds, which are higher than thou. All right, okay, there's the sun. Tonight there will be the stars, maybe Mars, maybe Venus. But look at them clouds. They're much closer. And you haven't even seen the third heaven. What are you, Joe? Come on, Joe, tell me what the third heaven's like. Tell me what, and, and I forget NASA and all that. Tell me what the, what the surface of Mars is like, Joe. Tell me what's on the dark side of the moon, Joe. Come on, you're so great. Tell me. I know God Almighty can tell us. If God would come down and say, God, I want you to tell us how many planets are, which is, I don't know if they knew or not. But I want you to tell us how many uh, planets are in the solar system and tell us how many moons each of the planets have. God would sit down and you could tell them. Because the Bible says God knows the stars, knows how many stars, and calls them by name. How are you doing, Joe? And this same conversation we will learn later, Lord willing, when God comes up and speaks to Joe. Behold the clouds which are higher than thou. See those clouds up there? You can't touch them. If thou sinnest, and he does, what doest thou against him, God? And what really, if we sin against God, what do we really do against God? We don't make God any unholier. We don't ruin the reputation of God if we sin. But we break that father and son relationship. We ruin that fellowship with God because of our sin. And it's to our advantage that we are clean, that we can have fellowship with God, and God be able to use us being clean and not unclean. Because God is not going to use an unclean vessel. He'll take that vessel, it's filthy, and throw it in the dishpan. And he'll reach for something that's clean. And if thy transgressions be multiplied over and over and over, what doest thou unto him? God gets no advantage of a sinner. There is nothing that we do for God. Oh, I go out and witness. God can find somebody else. And when we do, do not do what God wants us to do, God will find somebody else. And we not must think ourselves, we're the greatest church, I'm the greatest Christian, look at all the results. No, that's not it. Paul says, I planted Apollo's water, God gave the increase. We may go out there with the seed, we may go out there with a watering can, but God's the one that saved them, not us. And all I do is, is spoil and vile the name of God by being a Christian, by telling people I'm a Christian and sinning. If anything I do for God is I give people an excuse not to believe in God. If thou be righteous, what givest thou him? Or what receiveth he of thy hand? Okay, if you're righteous and Job says he is, Job is wonderful, Job is great, Job helps the widow, Job helps the father, Job clothes the naked, Job treats his employees all well, Job is kind to his fields, Job is kind to his animals, Job offers sacrifices for his son. Well, what's that do to God? And when Job dies, what's God going to miss? When we die, what's God going to miss? Nothing. Things will go on as God has planned and will plan and always will plan. 
Well, there are people added to heaven because, no, not because of me. They are added by God. He gives an increase. He gives an increase. Thy wickedness may hurt a man as thou art. You're just a man, Job. Your tongue, your attitude, your behavior may help hurt another man. And thy righteousness may profit the son of man. All right, if you're so right, you might give clothes to another man who needs clothes. All right, good. That's good. You might give a widow the comfort of the law that she needs and the just of the law. Okay, that's good. All right. You gave some coins to a homeless man to get a hamburger. That's okay. That's good. But what do you do for God? What's that do? Who do you think you are? It's what he's saying to verse 8. God is not in his glory, in his holiness. Oh, I, I son, move over. Let me have Job. Let me have a self-righteous man sit in the seat where you are, son, today. And this is the same attitude that man that Jesus said went to the temple. Oh, Lord God, I'm glad I'm not an extortion. I'm not glad I'm adulterous. I'm not glad this guy over here. But look how good I am. You know, I mean, when I come to temple, when I go to church, God just smiles on me. And there are many, and I've met a few people who have that idea. That God is so pleased with them. And those are the people, they don't do nothing for the Lord at all. All right, they may put money in the, in the treasury. They may put money in the uh, offering box or in the... Uh, you know, the offering envelope, that may help pay the electricity, that may help pay the AC, that may help put a little... But what does that guy do to God? He may help his fellow man. But I think God was doing pretty good before he made Adam. And when he made Adam, he gave Adam one command. Don't not eat of that fruit of that tree. And the man blew it. And man's been blowing it ever since. And we've got to get a new heart, new spirit, the Holy Spirit. We've got to have the new birth. We're going to get a new brand, brand new body. So we don't ever do what we're going to do, what we're doing today in glory. God's going to change us completely. By reason of the multitude of oppressors, oppressions, they make the oppressed to cry. Joe, life is full of troubles. And life is full of troubles, and there are troublers. And there are troublees. And the troublees are always crying because of troublers. They cry out of the reason of the arm of the mighty. And when I grew up, used to be, you know, you get an arm wrestling or some kind of wrestling with your friend, and you know the game was over when someone cried mercy. And in life, there's no mercy cry. You can cry mercy all you want to anybody, and if that person is vile, wicked, and mighty, and has the power, he's not going to let up. He's not going to give in. There are people today who need services of another person, and they're not getting it because that other person won't give it. Adolf Hitler and the Nazi rebel of World War II did not show any mercy to the, to the Hebrew people, did not show any mercy to the Gentiles. And they were mighty men, and they, the oppression of the Jewish people and the people of, of Europe and all that in America was vile and wicked, and there was no mercy from one man and his troops. But none saith, where is God my maker? Who giveth songs in the night? There is none that seeketh after God, Paul says. And I forget if he says there's none righteous or all have said. One of them actually said there's none that seek after God. And we got things today on the television. You know, they'll go through, you know, our father art in heaven and, and Mary full of grapes and other nonsense. You're not seeking God. That's not God. The world and their people do not seek God. And if they did, public ministry would be flowing out the windows, flowing out the doors. In six years, 
in the public ministry that we've had in one location, not one person has come out before anybody and received Christ. Now, they may have done it in their house. They may have done it in the church. They may have done it somewhere. But openly before the people at the farmer's market, they have not come out and received Christ as their Savior. And it's amazing how Elihu keeps mentioning that night, that night, that night, chapter 34. And it's just quiet as you can't sleep. Does the Lord give you a song in your heart? The world gives you songs. The world will play the garbagey, trashy music that's coming to the church house, trashy, garbage music of the devil. That ain't going to reveal it. That's going to make you sicker. Man, you're about to kill yourself. Don't you dare put country music on that. Make you even more deader. Who teaches, God teaches us more than the beasts of the earth. And maketh us wiser than the followers of heaven. Now, when you, um, I think it's Job or Proverbs, he says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Go ask the beast, of, you know. And there are animals out there. How does a spider make a spider web? And there are some spiders that they rabble up their, their, their web at night and they rebuild it in the morning. And yet this web can trap insects, but it don't trap the spider herself. There are ants out there that do all kinds of wondrous things. God told an ass, I want you to deliver a message, and that ass delivered a message. God told a raven, I want you to bring some food to a prophet of mine, and they brought a food to him. An untamed ass, Jesus said, I'm riding to Jerusalem, and ass, let's go. And God, I, God told a dove, I want you to go out there, I want you to grab that leaf and bring it back to Noah. There are animals that fly by God. They come up north and they go to the very spot where their family is down south. Those are God. I believe that's God. That's not evolution. That's God guiding those animals. And yet God gives man more knowledge, more teaching, more understanding, more wisdom than he does the animals. Not ever do you preach the gospel to an animal, even though it says every creature. I don't mean creatures as animals, that means mankind. But God has never meant his message. God has never shed his blood on Calvary for an animal. He has shed it out to man. God has sent forth all kinds of instruction. He sends it out in carols. He sends it out in hymns. He sends it out in preachers. He sends it out in print. He sends it out in the Bible. Now today, this day and age of this world, you don't hear hymns in the public no more. You don't hear the right carols of Christmas time as I heard as a boy. And when back when I grew up as a boy in the store, and you heard Christ, I know Jesus is not the reason for the season. Jesus has nothing to do with Christmas. And yet those carols sung about the birth of Jesus. That would instruct you, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And the world is leaving that. And those songs were never for a mouse. The gospel is not for a cat. Salvation is not of a dog. It is for man, and man, God will give a man who's saved, who will grow in milk, who will study the word of God, who will read the word of God, and be able to teach others and show lost people how to get saved and take Christians and grow them out of milk unto meat, like Paul said. And that's God teaching. It's never the preacher. It's never the Sunday school teacher. It's the Holy Spirit in us, working in us to God's glory. Not Job, who are you? Have you done something of God? Have you taught something? That ain't you. That's the Holy Spirit working in you. You got more knowledge than the animals. And yet there are some more, there are some animals out there more smarter than the man, but not according to the Bible. There they cry, but none giveth answer because of the pride of evil men. Pride of man will get him in trouble. Pride of man will make him not do something. That he should. Pride of man will make him do something that he should not do. Pride of man will, will not have him to say I'm sorry. Pride of man will have him not to be sorry. Pride of man won't use that conscience that God's given him. Surely God will not hear vanity. And people will say God hears the prayer of everybody. Not vanity prayers. I'll give you good examples of prayers that God does not hear. When it is a prayer on a television show or in the a play or on Broadway. When you got a family sitting down from the camera, okay, let's all say grace. God does not hear that nonsense. 
When you got a man portraying, oh, I'm going to pray to God in this church play or this Hollywood play or this Christmas play, God don't hear that prayer. It's vain. It's empty. It has no value. He won't hear it. And when you say uh, Mary full of grapes and disgrace and, and our father, and that is a vain prayer. God said, don't use vain repetition. When you use vain repetition, when you use prayer books, and you use prayer beads, and you do your prayer to the north with your arm face and right and your, your elbow over your head, God don't hear those vain prayers. Now, if you got a prayer that you reach out to God, you're in a foxhole, you're in trouble, you're somewhere, and your prayer reaches out to God for salvation, he'll answer those prayers. Many times a lost Catholic boy, I'd reach out to God, Almighty God, I didn't understand nothing. God answered my prayer when I seek God. There are many foolish prayers, even as a Christian, that I pray to God. That's, I ain't listening to that. That's nonsense. You just might as well shut up and go to bed. I'm not, God does not listen to vain prayers. Get that down. Neither will the Almighty regard it. If it's a vain, worthless prayer, God don't care. How do you like that verse? Although thou, Job, sayest thou shalt not see him, and Job said to wait, but Job did say, in my flesh, Though that my flesh corrupts, I will see God. Because uh, surely God, uh, although thou sayest thou shalt not see him, God, yet judgment is before him. Therefore, trust thou in him. It's almost not like Job said, "Okay, I'm going to see God the final resurrected day of the great judge." It's it's almost like God, Job, is saying, "I'm not going to see God any time in my life." God's going to show up to Job one day in in this book. I think it's chapter 38 or chapter 39. God's going to show up to Job. Because you think God can't see you, you think you cannot see God, that doesn't mean go out and do what God told you to do. Trust thou in him. Evidently, Job's not. Job is trusting his righteousness. But now, because it is not so, what is not so? You don't trust in him. Therefore, trust thou in him, but now because it's not so. You're not trusting in God, Job. You're setting everything on what you do. He visited in his anger. Now, notice Elihu's not calling Job wicked. And he's not saying, Job, you're going to hell because you're, you're a wicked, terrible person. No, he's like, God's angry with you. God had to get your attention. And if it's your children, if it's your livestock, if it's your wife, is it the, the, the boils? God got your attention, Job. Because he's angry with you. He's chastising you. And he's using the devil. Yet he knoweth it not in great extremity. Therefore, does Job open his mouth in vain? And he just told you, God doesn't listen to vanity. God wasn't listening to you, Job. Which is kind of funny because we have everything that Job said written down in the Bible. Oh, God would kill me. How come God didn't listen to Job? How come God didn't kill Job? Oh, this is nonsense. That guy's just shooting off his mouth. That's all he's doing. He's angry at me. He's angry at the world. Job, just shut up, will you? <laughs> That's what he's doing. And those three friends of yours? Oh, man. Can't wait to put this down in print. <laughs> Everything that Job and his three friends, because look, he said, um, verse 4, my companions. Everything that Job and his companions, it's vain. And we have a couple of chapters here that said, and Job continued his parable. Yeah, it's just a story to God. Is your prayer like, like that? Is it just a story? Is it just nonsense? Does it have any value or is it coming from your heart? Are you praying to God because you're in pain and sorrow? Come on, God. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. Okay, get rid of the pain. Oh, God, I, well, you know, I'm, I did this wrong. Bring back my children. 
That's vain. And it's getting a lot of people to say, Job, you got a greater, you got a more realistic problem. You and God are not right. He multiplies words without knowledge. What's the word? Job chapter 3, Job chapter 4, Job chapter 5. And on and on and on. And Elihu looks like he's recording it. And Elihu's saying, Job, all those words didn't come to nothing, did it? When you have finished, when the words of Job have finished or ended, I forget how it said. You know what the, the final words of Job was? Look how great I am. Look how wonderful I am, guys. Guys, I'm not wicked. I'm not going to hell. Look at everything I've done. I don't commit adultery. I, I, I don't cheat my employees. I, I, I help this. I help that. I do this. I do that. And God's like, you haven't got it. You haven't got it. Some people, it takes longer than others. But we have seen Job's mouth come out and proclaim his sin, self-righteous. Elihu is, is coming down righteously, rightfully, honorably to show Job this is your sin. He ain't blasting Job like his friends. He ain't dealing generally with anybody who could be anybody like his friend. He's like, it's you, Job. <coughs> Job, this is what you said. Job, this is what you said. Job, this is what you were thinking. And Job, as far as what that, this is God's attitude to you. This is what God was thinking about that. This is what God has to say about it. And you're in the same condition you are 34 chapters later, and you have learned nothing. And there are Christians that go their entire life, saved Christians, they go their entire life, and they learn nothing. Because they don't learn how to read their Bible, they don't learn how to study their Bible, they don't know how to pray, they don't know how to seek God, but they're going through the motions. And they think they're fine, they think they're well, and they're not. And every Christian needs to, at some time in their life, get off alone, frequently, no one bother, no telephone, no worldliness. Get out alone with God and say, God, what problems do you have with me? What sins are you talking about that are affecting you and me? And Christians won't do that because they know that God's going to go after that most favorite sin that they have. And God has worked through Christians. He has shown them like a lie who is doing. And many Christians turn off from, I don't want to hear it, Lord. I want to do what I want to do. And thank God Job doesn't do that. King Saul did that. Oh, yeah, I know. I did wrong. It's my troops fault. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, come on, David. I'm sorry. I've sinned against you. And he goes right back sinning against David all again. Saul never learned. Saul died and went to hell. Job picked up. Job learned. Job dies and goes to wherever Gentiles go before the law. And will go to glory, probably to new uh, heavens. You're either going to listen to God or you're going to just go on with your life and you can be saved, but you're not going to get all the beneficial because you won't do what God wants you to do. God, you don't want to listen to God. You don't want to do right before God because you are right in your own eyes, in your own ears. You're the great one. You're the perfect. There's nothing wrong with you, but look at every other Christian. And God ain't going to deal with you. When you got troubles in your life, you say, God, look at that bad family over there. Look at the bad things you're doing. Don't point to listen. The beam that's in your eye. Come on, let's get rid of that first. And many Christians are like that. 